Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Helen Soslowski, the Events Director for Oblong Books. Before I welcome our guests this evening, I have a few instructions for those of you who've not attended our events before. If you have questions for either of our guests at any time during the presentation, you can type them in the chat module, which you'll find at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And to view the chat, you just click on that box and, and the chat will appear in a column on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also ask questions in the Ask a Question module, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who would like to purchase a paperback copy of Vespa Flights, there's a green Buy the Book button right at the bottom of your screen, and that will take you to Oblong Books, where you can purchase a copy. So without further ado, we're delighted this evening to welcome back to Oblong, albeit from afar this time, uh, best-selling author of H is for Hawk, Helen MacDonald, who's joining us tonight from the UK to celebrate the paperback release of her latest book, Vespa Flights. Helen is a writer, naturalist, and an affiliated research scholar at the University of Cambridge Department of History and Philosophy of Science. H is for Hawk won the 2014 Samuel Johnson Prize and the Costa Book Award. In Vesper Flights, Helen brings together a collection of her best loved essays, along with new pieces on topics ranging from nostalgia for a vanishing countryside, excuse me, can't get my papers separated, <laughs> to the tribulations of farming ostriches, to her own private Vespers while trying to fall asleep. Conducting the conversation with Helen this evening is author and editor and good friend of Oblong Books, Susan Fox Rogers. Susan is writer in residence at Bard College. She's the author of My Reach and the editor of 10 anthologies, including Antarctica and most recently, When Birds Are Near. Susan is joining us this evening from France. Welcome to you both. It's a pleasure to have you join us this evening. And Susan, I'm now going to hand off to you. Great. Well, I, I have to say I couldn't be more thrilled to have this evening with you, Helen, because uh, I am huge fan of H's for Hawk and um, also Vesper, Vesper Flight. So I thought we would begin with the most obvious thing about this collection, which is that it's a collection of essays. And um, and uh, I, as somebody who uh, loves reading essays and who writes essays, I think if anybody can make them popular, it's you. And um, I think the thing that I uh, love about the essays are those moments of, um, tension within an essay where two things collide and you are uh you did not disappoint me once uh with any of these essays with that ability to sort of uh have things rub up against each other and there's that the some of my favorites were when you describe the wax wings as both highly classy and fantastically trashy to look at um, <laughs> and or the the glow worms that that are things both sublime and ridiculous and then that moment when you're watching an eclipse when you say I'm tiny and huge all at once, as lonely and singular as I've ever felt and as merged and part of a crowd as it is ever possible to be. So those moments like that, and it seems like that's how, that's actually sort of how you see the world, but it's also seems to be that intellectually and emotionally, it's how you live, that you have uh, again and again, these moments that are both exhilarating and humbling, that they're magic and they're unbearable. And so I would love for you to just talk about the pleasures of writing an essay or the challenges of that, you know, that sort of how you manage to uh, have that complexity again and again, that to me is sort of, as it were, the plot of an essay, you know, sort of really kept me going. It's like, where's this going to go next? You know, so... Well, that's just the most phenomenal question. I'm not, my brain is you know, quite often when, when I'm asked questions, I'm just like, oh, it's that question. I'll just answer that question. And now I'm like, oh, wait, this is really interesting. Like, what? Um, <laughs> I'm like, things. And, and you've picked up, I think, um, you know, that, that sense of the, the, the oppositions and collisions between frames of references, that's something that, that happens all the time in the essays. And it's, it's something that happens all the time when I'm out there as well. And this yeah. notion that you can, flip between figure and ground, you know, in, in an instant and occupy, you know, the F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, two incommensurable spaces at the same time seems to be very much what I value about, you know, what it can be like to be out in the natural world. Um, mm -hmm. 
And also the other tension that runs through the essays, which of course, as we, may, we might talk about, which is the constant collision between nature as it seems to our sort of eyes and ears and senses, uh, something that's not us, it's the opposite of us, but at the same time, we, we completely load with human meaning. So we have that collision all the time as well when we look at it. So that I really love that you brought up those, the, those tensions and oppositions. So thank you for that. Um, but as for essays, you know, it was a word that I used to hate. I mean, I was the world's worst. <laughs> yeah, I was the world's worst student at school and I never finished anything. You know, I'm a sort of ADHD type person and, and I found essay writing indescribably hard and, and I always get bored and wander off and do something else. Um, and I was always in trouble for never doing my homework. Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, I started thinking about essays seriously when I started reading more as I, you know, as I grew up basically and discovered this form. And, and I hadn't really started writing them properly until I guess I did a bit of blogging, but then I started getting uh, commissioned to write features and articles and, and a column yeah. for the Times Magazine. And that was just completely eye-opening for two reasons. And one, that I was working for the first time with an editor in the American mm -hmm. way, which is very different <laughs> English way. So in England, if you write an, if you write a piece for a newspaper and send it off, they just publish it. Often they'll take out the most important bit and don't tell you. <laughs> it makes no sense anymore. Um, but in America, as you know, like you know, it's a very, very delicate and beautiful collaboration with an editor. You know, you both work on a piece, and and I found this terrifying to start with, and then so wonderful. And I began to sort of see essays as these collaborative uh, efforts, and then I began to see the reader as part of that collaboration. So a lot of these essays are. To me, I'm going on already, but they, they seem to be a little bit like a walk in the countryside. They're like a walk with a reader behind my shoulder, this implied reader. And I'm often very puzzled by what I'm, what's going on. I'm, I don't know everything. And um, obviously, and so many of these essays are, are, are puzzles that mm -hmm. I want to solve and I want the reader to come with me. So they feel like that. That's how they feel to me. They're essays, they're, they're partial, they're, they're like the workings out in the margin of a, of a math book. And it does, it does feel at the end of the essays, a lot of the times that you sort of come to some kind of understanding, you know, there's these yeah. elegant, elegant endings to your, to these essays where, and, and in fact, what I, what I was intrigued by, there's sort of that little, mon, the little hint of Montaigne in there where you, you sort of flip around our, our way of, of thinking about something or, or understanding something in, in ways that just felt kind of subtle and, and yet um, completely organic, you know, it was beautifully done. Thank you. I mean, I try to do that. I mean, I, I did worry that there was too much of that because, but generally, that's that's how it works for me. You know, I'll, I'll puzzle and puzzle, and I'll be like, yeah. "Oh, right, you know, that's how, that's what it is yeah. for me." Um, yeah. But it's not like a magician pulling a you know a, a, a sort of cloth off a table to reveal a dove. It's generally something that seems quite hard one to <laughs> It works. Yeah, yeah, very, very honestly, one. Yeah. So there, I feel that after reading these essays, there's not anybody who would read them and not feel uh, sort of energized to go out and, and just learn more about what's around there, that your attention to detail and your attention to the natural world, um, even though several of these essays are not uh, directly about that, uh, sort of more indirectly, like your essay on migraines, for instance, um, and you have, but you have that great line from T.H. White saying the best thing for being sad is to learn something. And then your own line, which is there's an immense intellectual pleasure involved in making identifications, which, you know, when I when I took off uh, paying attention to birds 10 years ago, it was that it was just sort of this thrill, this sort of intellectual thrill of like, my God, this this all makes more sense to me. So um, but then but then, of course, you know, because of how you write, there's the downside to that. And, and so you have that great line, which is increasingly knowing your surroundings, recognizing the species of animals and plants around you means opening yourself to constant grief. So, you know, to, 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 to sort of go out into the world and, and, to, and, and as I've had sort of this wondrous moment of sort of uh, seeing and identifying and feeling that intimacy with the natural world and then it has led to more grief and more and and that sort of environmental understanding that comes with it. So um, I'm not sure this is a really a question, but how do you how do you uh, how do you live with both of those things? I guess and uh, sort of continue with the intellectual pleasure and and the you know the if it really is the best thing for being sad is to learn something, which to me would be to learn about the birds. 
<laughs> it sort yeah, of keeps rolling know. back on itself, correct? You know, it's sort of yeah. No, the intellectual pleasure is hilarious. I remember Bert. This is a very different. This is a bit of a sidebar to to answer this question. I remember being in Central Park a few years ago and meeting a whole bunch of birders, American birders, and they were all basically hipster dudes, right? And I was like laughing because they were all kind of <laughs> over the precise. You know patterns on the on the wing covers of warblers and i'm like oh my god birding is so hipster over here you know it's like it's a real kind of like <laughs> it was great um yes bearing witness <laughs> a, very, a very dear friend who's uh someone very beloved to them is is very very ill and um she lives in uh the southern hemisphere and she was talking about how Right now, spring is happening or slowly happening, and she can see buds coming out on on the trees and the birds start to sing, and it's it's the sharpest, most painful love and grief combination to see that new life happening at a time of of anticipated loss, and I think that that really does you know I, I you know not to belittle anything that she's going through uh, by making it into a a point about the natural world and and, and generally, but but I think you know. Um, Older Leopold said, you know, the penalties of an ecological education are to open yourself to a world living in a world of wounds. And and everything that I see, you know, is is marked with that that grief now. But I mean, in a way that, you know, all our lives are. It's mortality is always waiting for us, you know, it's gonna be there. <laughs> but, uh, I think it's it's paying attention is important. And I, there's a question related to that, and it's about expertise. So mm -hmm. I want to ask, how much do you need to know? You know, there's a lot of gatekeeping in nature writing and in nature appreciation, as you know. If you don't know the names, you know, people look down their noses at you, and you don't need to know the names. But if you do need to know the names and identify things, you can see what's missing. And I think that attention is very, very important because, you know, if you look at a sort of stretch of green that's a meadow that's just like two or three species that's been fertilized, it's just kind of a bit of a monoculture or technically sort of, but, you know, there's it's not the same thing as a meadow that's full of, you know, herbage and insects and plants. There's more life there. So expertise is important um, and attention is important. And I think attention is really, the book is about love and the book is about paying attention. And I think a lot of nature writers are around my age and we've all, we're all starting to write really, or writing partly as bearing witness. You know, I, I quote writer Henry Green in the book, you know, that, you know, those of us who do not have time to write must now take stock. And I think there's a lot of that in nature writing right now, which is very heartbreaking. Yeah, it is heartbreaking. I, I mean, it, it just as you say, I guess that is, uh, that is the experience of life. It just feels like when you look at the natural world, that combination of love and grief just feels amplified, right? Um, to, it's, to terrifying. it's terrifying. Now. There's a news today that the Amazon is now um, emitting more CO2 than it's producing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very hard to maintain hope in this scenario, but we have to, we have to keep, keep yeah. that space open. And, and oddly, it seems like the, the one place of hope that you had in, in these collections was in the essay on migraines. Um, am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I was I that that was a really interesting essay. So that was actually just going to be about migraines because I find them fascinating. I mean, they're wild, right? You can't control them. Like these neurological <laughs> yes. a lot of people have. Um, no one really knows exactly why or how or what or you know. And I laugh about the world. Have that line that we know more about climate change than we do about yeah. migraines. <laughs> and then I was laughing about the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is basically the perfect, you know, lack of any physical or mental, you know, problems. And it's like, yeah, no one's <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. So I, I'm thinking about this and, and thinking about how one of the things about my migraines is I can never tell when that I'm going to have one, you know. And and the, the weird thing is, I, I I know all the symptoms of them coming. I buy chocolate, I buy banana milk, I want to eat beetroot, I get really grumpy. You know, these are all very familiar things. When they're happening, I never make the connection. Mm -hmm. So I make this connection with migraines. Um, it just slipped into my head one day. It's like maybe the reason that we can't really understand what's mm -hmm. happening, can't grasp the reality of climate change is, is partly yeah. like that because the structures of late capitalism make it impossible for us to understand yeah. the cause you know, symptoms as you know and cause and symptoms in front of us yeah. and you know we're told to not to not buy plastic straws but at the same time you know that's not going to do that much you know we need to really come together and raise our voices so that's really a plea for action that piece and also mm -hmm. I feel sorry for myself when I have a migraine yeah but well, I mean it's so brilliant done because it, 
you know, again, again and again, like you say, you, st you set out to write this essay about migraines, which would be an essay about yourself, right? And then it moves outward. And, and so you have these, you know, just, it's it's almost uh you know these 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 p little pieces of information about yourself just enough that we keep with you right but you never take over i mean you remain our lens through this and and uh there's certainly pieces within the collection that are more investigative uh the piece with um uh, I forget her first name. Uh, is it Chabrol? When you go to the yeah. Atacama yeah. Desert, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. which is just an extraordinary essay, right? And and uh, and uh, th there, your your lens is is outward. But every now and again, we get your you, you know you being cold or you being miserable camping yeah. in this. I uh, yeah, that was I was up in the end. <laughs> it was not enough oxygen. I started to get these really weird like deja vu episodes, and at the end, I'm just like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. I haven't got a clue. You know, this idea of the objective reporter reporter voice was just all over the shop. Sorry, I'm butting in. I get very excited about. No, it. no, 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 no. <laughs> the people are here to hear you yeah. talk. Um, yeah, no, that it's interesting. So, 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 you know, it's you know, it's a very obvious point, I guess, in some ways. But you know, I, I love that that nature writer's voice that I grew up with, which was the distanced, objective voice of God that was like, you know, aren't you lucky to have me to tell you this? You know, um, <laughs> very easy to fall into that voice. It's a very seductive okay. voice, that, that expert. Mm. And um, it, I had to learn to, to confess when I didn't know stuff, you know. That, that mm. was, you know, I, I would come back and I'd, I'd find a mushroom species yeah. and I'd, I need to know what that is before I write about it. And I'm like, that's dishonest, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. um, but I do put myself in these pieces and, and I do that for reasons that are, I guess, pretty simple. And that's just the kind of old anthropological trick of, of you need to be, mm -hmm. you need to put yourself in to show your own biases to the reader. Otherwise, the reader's going to, yes. Know, Take the pieces, something. Well, and who who is this? Who is my lens, right? You know, we want to know who who's who's leading us out there. You know, so when I knew that you read Enid you know, Blyton books as a child, I was like, <laughs> I did. And they were so. I mean, I don't know. They, they they sort of reissued them now, and they've taken out some of the worst racism. But my God, yeah, I know. I mean, I I, I, I read as a kid, yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, there was one essay in here that I, I felt like I learned so much uh, from and then connected to other essays, but Swan Upping, something that I knew nothing about. So maybe you could explain that to the people in the audience. But you, within that essay and then in several others, you write about the fact that you're fascinated by the relationship between natural history and national history. And there's that great line from Julian Huxley and 1942 saying that if you don't know your birds you can't fully know your country and peter scott who who is the son of the, one of the great loves of my life robert robert falcon scott says that you know when he was talking about he was fighting to protect the mallards and the teal rearing their families in the reed beds of slapped and lay i mean it's just uh, so so exquisite so you know this this connection of sort of the natural and the national it's something that I mean, maybe it exists in the United States, but it's not something that I've thought about and that I see. And, you know, we have a national bird that I consider to be um, slightly lazy. And and um, uh, <laughs> I see the eagles floating along the Hudson River, sort of hoping yeah, 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 yeah. to practically come to them. And whenever you see an eagle in a, in a film, they usually have the superimpose it with the call of a red-tailed hawk. You know, it's like in the United States, people don't even know don't even know the natural bird. <laughs> red tailed so, noises drives me up the wall. I, I honestly, I just laugh my head off about that red tailed noise. It's, it's everywhere. You name it, you're going to hear that that noise. Uh, sorry, I, I've never been asked about that before. I just need to. <laughs> Sorry, please continue, Susan. No, I, I but I, 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 so, so that connection is just something that uh, fascinated me because I do feel in Britain people are much more attuned to uh, birds in particular. I mean, it's hard to find, uh, hard to meet a Brit who doesn't own a pair of binoculars and at least, you know, knows their chaffinch. So, um, but I'm just sort of, uh, have you, I mean, you've spent a fair amount of time in the United States now. Um, uh, do you see any of that connection between the national and the natural? I mean, we there are, of course, our, nat our national parks that are, you know, sort of these great symbols of um, preservation and, and land and space, and they're mostly out west. But I don't know, I, and maybe you haven't thought about it in relation to other countries, but uh, the, 
that might, but maybe explain the swan upping to people and, and which is yeah. <laughs> well, this is great. I mean, I, you know, this is this is like a four hour, you know, answer. I want to say here. Um, there are not many questions, you know, questions that I get that are so these are very generative questions. This is roughly mm. wonderful. One upping is is bonkers. It's a uh, it's. Uh, I wanted to write an essay about Brexit. This this essay this essay this piece was written just yeah. after the vote, and things were pretty grim. I didn't recognize my country. Basically, it was suddenly you know apparent that what I assumed Britain was it wasn't, and that was a bit of a shock. And um, I thought I'm going to go and do something and look at something that is the most eccentric British thing ever. And I just I decided that swan upping would work because it involves birds. And so basically, all the swans in Britain are owned by the Queen, of course. Of course. Apart from the, <laughs> the Thames, the you know the, the the river that flows through London, they're all they are shared out between the Crown or the Queen and two medieval guild companies. You know, of course, right? Uh, so every every summer, there's this procession of boats that are crewed by you know these these very muscly um, uh, watermen from the lower reach of the river who major mainly their job is to sort of drive tugboats and, and, and direct traffic on the river. But basically they just, they just row these wooden boats up the Thames and they, a lot of them, are, uh, they're, they're directed by a man who is the queen's keeper of the swans who wears a uniform and he has a swan feather in his hat. And what they do is catch all the swans, all the, all the swans on the river. And then they mark the young birds according to who owns them. Right. Which is, you know, again, Walker, and they put the on them. And um, it's, I just thought this is the most English thing ever. I'm going to go along and see, see this and I'm going to talk to you about Brexit and see what happens. And what happened on that was I got, I was totally and utterly swept into this sort of fever dream of, of, of Englishness. It's the most beautiful river. It's surrounded by incredible real estate, you know, these very fancy houses. And um, I was told stories about World War II and about bravery and about this is a real kind of English patriotism. And I, I started to sort of think about that and I ended up getting really obsessed with how you could counter these stories that are always of exclusion, right? They're very yeah. powerful. I could feel the toe of them. Yeah. And I thought about this painter called Stanley Spencer who lived in one of the villages. In fact, the village I started this little tour from Cookham and he went to China in the 50s on this uh, delegation with a bunch of artists and diplomats. And he was a very strange man. And uh, at one point, um, Chuan Lei stood up and gave this big speech about China. This is not answering your question about, about um, American regional, regional nature. But so the premier stood up and asked a question about China. All the diplomats were like, oh, God, what do we say? You know, he said, do you like China? What do you think of China? And uh, Stanley Spencer got up much to the horror of everyone there because politically he really was terrifying, naive. And he said to the Chinese premier, um, have you ever been to Cookham? Do you know Cookham? Um, let me tell you about Cookham. And everyone's like, what is he doing? And he said, you know, when, it, when I now I've been traveling in China, when I'm in China, I feel that Cookham is somehow near. And he talked to the, the premier about village life about raising ducks and about looking after your gardens and about getting on with your neighbors. And the premier had grown up in a village too in China. And it sparked this astonishingly animated conversation. And I kept thinking of on that tour because I kept thinking, you know, the particularity of the local, of the small, of yeah. the crowded doesn't have to be nationalistic, crypto-fascist, you know, populist. It can just be about people everywhere doing some of the same things. And that was really helpful to me, that essay in that regard. It was a really inspiring moment. Um, and as for America and, and, and America, American nature, I think it's more regional. I really do. And I think so, you know, yeah. you know the Rocky, Rocky Mountains and the Bighorn Sheep, you know, and a lot of that is tied up with a kind of development of roads and tourism. Um, there's all these stories in America that, you know, that are sort of hidden, you know, the, the, that are again related to nationality and to nationhood and to, uh, and they're kind of hidden. Like, for example, um, I remember reading about how a lot of the laws against shooting songbirds in America were basically to stop Italian immigrants from shooting, from trespassing on people's land and shooting songbirds to eat, right? So it wasn't to pick the songbird, it was stop the Italians. So um, that that kind of thing, that's the kind of story I like to unpick because I feel that so much of nature is, you know, we, we're taught that it's the place free of human meaning. It's the one place free of human meaning, but it's where we put a lot of our stuff that we don't want anyone to think is human at all. It's, it's net yeah. neutral. And a lot of xenophobia gets, gets pushed into it.
Yeah. And, and, you know, tied in with what you were talking about, sort of keeping the Italians from shooting the birds, there's that uh, moment when you're talking about um, class and owning pet birds, right? That it's, it, it's, it's a certain class that often it owns these sort of, you know, small birds, right? And, uh, and then there's, oh, I, I'm not going to remember it, but it's, it's a line about sort of, uh, there's the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, right? And you you throw in a line like that, and and then you keep moving though, which is really great. So it's sort of as the reader, I felt like uh, a lot of the, I mean, the pleasure of of the reading was was sort of having these lines thrown at at me, and then just sort of stopping and saying, wait, you know, what 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 has she just done here, and sort of and going yeah. with that. So it's what what? Sorry, no. no. Oh, it's just it's Britain, you know. Class is everywhere, you know. I, I, I uh, you know, we, we are. Really <laughs> I think you know the, the big question to ask about the natural world, or one of the big questions is, you know, who has the right not only to define what it is, but what questions we ask of it, and who's allowed to interact with it. And generally, power and class is tied up with that, particularly class in Britain. And you know, there's an example in here that I absolutely adore, and that's about the aesthetics of class and taste. So you can buy nest boxes for birds in Britain everywhere. And all the big organizations say you should use a plain wooden nest box, just plain, you know, it's for the birds, not us. And they really don't like people who have like painted ones with like little like window boxes and like they're painted like a sort of little inn or a pub or a little restaurant with like, you know, <laughs> and they're like, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, it's just the same, you know, it's really interesting, this sort of notion. And I think a lot of that is that when these bird protection organizations started in the 1930s, what they were trying very hard to do was to make themselves, they were basically make themselves into a serious boy run organizations because before that birds were sentimental women's things. So mm -hmm. they tried very hard to make themselves scientific. They make themselves non-sentimental. So anything that was like smacked of, you know, non elite, non-masculine things was kind of pushed out of the way. And that's just really fascinating to me, I think. That's the kind of thing that I really like to uncover. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's got me thinking about uh, this country in many ways. Um, so I loved the title essay, Vesper Flights, um, partly because I didn't know the, I didn't know about Vesper Flights. I mean, it, uh, it, I love watching Swifts, but this was, this was a new, just delicious set of words for me. So will you read to us from? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, in the paper paperbacks, very exciting. I it's got really the hard cover. <laughs> it's finally kind of just sort of settled down and breeze when it's a paperback. Let me see that buy the book button, buy the paperback, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> So let me find this. Uh, yeah, Swift. I'm. I mean, I'm, I'm, there's one on the cover. I'm pretty obsessed with them. They they inhabit the, the air. The cover is spectacular. Yes. Yeah. They they uh, like fish inhabit the sea. They they basically never land and, and unless they're breeding. I mean, that's I'm gonna read a, a little bit here. Um, on warm summer evenings, Swifts that aren't sitting on eggs or tending their chicks fly low and fast, screaming in speeding packs around rooftops and spires. Later. They gather higher in the sky, their calls now so attenuated by air and distance that to the ear they corrode into something that seems less than sound, to suspicions of dust and glass. And then, all at once, as if summoned by a call or a bell, they rise higher and higher until they disappear from view. These flights are called Vespers flights, or Vesper flights, after the Latin Vesper for evening. Vespers are evening devotional prayers and the last and most solemn of the day. And I've always thought, thought that the phrase Vesper flights, the most beautiful one, it's like an ever falling bloom. For years, I've tried to see them do it, but always the dark got too deep or the birds skated too wide and far across the sky for me to follow. And for years, we thought Vesper flights were simply swifts flying higher up to sleep on the wind. Like other birds, they can close one eye and put half their brain to sleep with the other half awake and the other eye open for flight. But it's likely that swifts properly sleep up there too, drift into REM states where both eyes are closed and flying is automatic, at least for short periods. During the First World War, a French aviator on special night operations cut his engine at 10,000 feet and glided down in silent, close circles over enemy lines, a light wind against him, the full moon overhead. 
We suddenly found ourselves, he wrote, among a strange flight of birds which seemed to be motionless or at least showed no noticeable reaction. They were widely scattered and only a few yards below the aircraft, showing up against a white sea of cloud underneath. He had flown into a small party of swifts in deep sleep, miniature black stars illuminated by the reflected light of the moon. He managed to catch two. I know this is impossible, but I like to imagine that he or his navigator simply stretched out a hand and picked them gently from the air. And one swift was pulled dead from the engine after the flight returned to earth. The remote air, the coldness, the stillness, and the high birds over white clouds suspended in sleep. It's an image that drifts in and out of my dreams. So good. <laughs> Thank you. That is just fantastic. Um, what an image! And and this um, this this aviator here is is this something you read about? Where, where yeah, did I did. It's in it's in a wonderful book by David Lack, who was a, a real pioneer in swift uh, biology studies. He he uh, um, also studied the robin. He was very famous for that. And he um, it's in his book on the swift. I, and I I have a sort of I can find the French. In fact, it's quite bad when I'm reading it. I want to do it in a French accent, which would be terribly rude. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> no, no, he worked in Oxford and um, on, in the in the, the museum there in the, you know, a very long time ago. He set up these nest boxes for swifts with glass backs so you can actually watch these birds on the nest. And it's very amazing. This study has been going on for, for many, many years. But, you know, swifts on the nest are the most incredible things because they scuttle like mice. They've got these tiny feet that can barely move. And except cling, and their their wings are so long, they kind of drag behind them like swords. It's the most strange experience watching them, and they're very snuggly. They they kind of stick to each other like Velcro. They really love to kind of cuddle, which is the most wonderful thought, considering they spend the rest of the year absolutely not touching anything at all. You know, it's it's apart from water when they bathe and they go into the water. Amazing. Well, and then later in the collection, you have a, an essay. But about a friend of yours who rehabilitates swifts. Yeah. Particular, which is just such a fantastic thing that imagining holding them and, you know, uh, setting them to, to fly, knowing that, in fact, they probably won't land again for a very long time. Yeah, right. Sure it is, yeah. The most important thing if anyone finds a grounded swift, you know, there's a lot of information, you know, that people sort of say you just throw them very high in the air because they can't take off from the ground. The problem is a lot of them are injured. So if you do that, they tend to fall down again and then they die because they hit the ground hard. So don't do that. You know, um, the best way to try it is to just put them on your open palm and hold them up into the wind and wait. And and often they'll just take off themselves. So yeah, yeah there you go. But and it's public that, information there. Yeah, no, it's a very, very important information there. When you find yourself, but Swifts are one of those birds that you know you see soaring over a village and and chattering around to themselves. You never see them up close. And there's there's a lot in these collections about um, wanting to be close to animals. There's that that wonderful moment when the swan sort of comes up and essentially snuggles up to you, and sort of you know all of these different ways that we you know, whether it's rehabilitating animals or having pets or feeding them. And there's, and you, you know, once again, in in, in, in your Helen way, which I've started to think of is, is sort of the, the desire for that and the need for that and the beauty of that. And yet there's also maybe a, a downside to it too, that, um, that, that it's, it's complicated, right? So that when we, when we're feeding the birds, we feel like we're doing a, a good thing, but but not always. You know, there's disease that comes in, or there's um, uh, you know habituating birds so that they don't migrate and they don't follow their usual paths. You know, that that sort of the complexity of that. Um, mm -hmm. So, how do you resolve that in your own life? I mean, obviously, you've had very close relationships with animals. Um, <laughs> this is, and you you have a bird somewhere there with you. I did. I I, I had a jack. Oh. A friend of mine uh, had, had a, actually an actual abandoned fledgling jackdaw in their garden, like a small crow with a blue eyes and a sort of gray hood. And I, you know, as usual, she said, I've got this bird in my garden. What do I do? And she's, I'm like, leave it. The parents are feeding it. And then I checked in and she said the parents were feeding it maybe once a day. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm coming over. And I picked it up and it was starving. So I read it on and I've given it back to her. She's putting it in an aviary or try and release it back into the wild. It's, you know, it's 
it was reared mostly by its parents, so we think it can probably reintegrate to a flock. But the one the reason I had to give it back is because it was like it was like a psychotic toddler with a chisel. And it would unerringly find the most expensive thing in my kitchen and then set about destroying it. And at one point I was typing trying to do my taxes, and I realized that every 12 seconds I was shouting, Stop breaking this. <laughs> And then it flew into my face carrying a sheet of cellophane or purse, you know, like I was just like, no, I can't, I can't do this. You know, I felt like um, I felt like <laughs> parents who have kids a little bit later and, you know, they're kind of exhausted and they say, I wish we'd done this when I was like 19 or something. 19 or 20, yeah. <laughs> Oops. So, um, but it's it's very important. I mean, that that sense of, you know, how do I how do I square that, that sense yeah. of, you know, we're we're all hypocrites. I mean, we we, yeah. we are. I mean, we we have to live in the world. And one of the things I worry about is the sense that we now think of the natural world as something behind plate glass. We're not supposed to touch it. We're not supposed to interact with it. We're not supposed to have any kind of um, impact on it. You know, while at the same time we're having more impact on it in a kind of industrial kind of you know way than than we ever have. Um, so in my own life, I don't know. Separating the. Um, the desire to be close to animals with a knowledge of that a lot of that desire is 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 it's just me right i want to i want to know more i want to i want to interact with these creatures and the, the the important thing for me i think is to think about what the animal how the animal sees the world and how the animal sees my intervention and i think trying to put oneself in the mind of an animal mm. a lot of Thing about that, you know, there's a lot of kind of sentimentality and anthropomorphism. But I think as a philosophical activity, it's incredibly interesting and important to try and do that empathy because I, as I write in the book, it it forces you to start to think about what the animal right need and want in a landscape, and it's not um, and 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 then thinking about the projections that we put on these animals. You know, I always think of that amazing Annie Dillard piece about meeting a weasel. I love. It when I was a teenager, it's still a beautiful piece, but when I read it now, it scares the life out of me that she looks into a weasel's eyes and she sees this kind of Nietzschean creature, right? <laughs> you know, you know, we just must like grasp hold of our, of our and never let go. And I'm like, geez, you know, really? You know, got some kids somewhere and it's got an achy leg and it wants to sunbathe. You know, we put this stuff there. Right, so, right. I resolve that a lot by thinking about that. And I, 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 the magical moments come, I think, when recognizing the human meanings you've given animals and suddenly an animal will look right past those meanings and look, and it will be the newest thing in the world. And that happened to me, I think, most powerfully in New Zealand a few years ago. I was uh, at a, um, I was looking at this in the English woman that studied the Swift, David Lack is the name of the Blair, sorry, sorry, question pop up. So I was standing on the second, thinking, you know, albatrosses, albatrosses, you know, how am I going to know what they look like? I know what they look like, but am I going to know? And they're all these gulls, you know. And then I looked up and this albatross was there. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was like a dog hanging in the air. So it was like the hugest thing. Yeah. And it just came in off the wind. And I was lucky enough to go right out into the actual, like, I was sort of in the kind of private bit. You know, it's the benefits of being a nature writer is you get to go places that are private. And it flew right past me on these long wings, unmoving wings, with its its feet head out like like rudders. And it turned its head down this kind of long squid cutting beak, and it looked right at me. These amazing kind of dark Madonna like kind of eyes. Mm. And I looked at it, and I guess it was like the weasel Dillard thing. You know, I looked into its eyes, and the world just suddenly felt it was all spray and the Pacific and the you know the ocean, not the Pacific. Oh, and coldness and squid and this incredibly alien life. But basically the, the, the bird felt like it brought that newness to me. The, this, this albatross was not Coneridge, it was not Baudelaire, it was not guilt, it was not anything, it was just itself. Right. And that transformed not only that day, but you know, these, these encounters can be transformative. So I think that's, that's also something that can happen. But I think it's again about attention. You need to kind of try and think what you're bringing to the encounter and then try as fast as you can and try and see what's there. It's impossible, but you've got to try. Yeah. And sometimes the animals will meet you and bring it to you. Yeah, what a beautiful response. So um, I, we're sort of, we're moving into maybe question time. So people yes. come, come, up, come up with your good questions, but yes. I wanted to ask you about um, one more thing in the, in the Numinous Ordinary, which is a great title for an essay. Um, you were talking about sort of your search for language 
to describe experiences that you were having, I, I believe, while you were writing H is for Hawk, right? And um, your, your, your turn toward religious uh, texts and writings um, because the secular language didn't, didn't really do the job as it were, right? And, um, and I thought, of course, and it, you know, it sort of explained a lot of the beautiful passages in that book and then also uh, in the essays in this collection as well. And so I'm wondering what is, what is that, um, you know, sort of that uh, culling of, or the gathering of language or images to describe experiences that are indescribable really. Um, and, and, you know, obviously from religious texts, but uh, scientific work as well, I'm, I'm thinking, um, uh, and, I, and I'm thinking of that uh, beautiful essay about the, the ants that are sort of this tower of ants and the gulls yeah. come in, right? And you say, we so often think of science as somehow subtracting mystery and beauty from the world, but it's things I've learned from scientific books and papers that are making what I'm watching almost unbearably moving. And um, so I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, you know, what you've got a magpie mind, you know, you're sort of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, and, and, and you know, and, and again, also that again, I guess it's a function of my my career in this. In that, you know, I I was a natural historian from when I was very small. My math is terrible. I had to, I couldn't do biology, so I ended up doing literature. Um, but then I did history of science, and I worked at conservation. So there's been a lot of different places I've moved through. Mm -hmm. and in all those places, you know, everyone around me, not everyone, but but it's basically kind of assumed that the way that that world works and the way that world talks about the world is the right way, is the authoritative way. And I'm like, well, yeah, we can't all be saying that. You know, it's like when student kind of, I get um, references for students and they're from the same teacher and they all say that this is the greatest student I've had in 20 years. And I'm like, well, yeah, man, you've, you've written that for four students this year. So <laughs> I, I think, um, Grabbing from genres is something I I, I like to do, and 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 I the, there's one example in this book that I think try try to get across why I feel that's important, and that's this this example of emblematic natural histories. So you know, in in the sort of 16th century, this this form of uh, writing about animals has reached its kind of you know its zenith really. So an emblematic natural history is it's it's a history that's a bit like a bestiary. It's a bit like Basically, every animal that's being written about in these natural history books, you get all the factual information that the writer knew about that creature, you know, how big it is, what color it is, where it lives, what it eats, all those things we'd call scientific now. And of course, science is unbelievably crucial as a way of talking about the world. You know, this is not an anti-scientific book. This is like, you know, we need science. You know, we need that form of knowledge more than now, more than anywhere. More than ever. Oh, yeah. More than ever, yeah. Um, but these books also contained other knowledge about these creatures, and that was knowledge about what we, how we've used them in myth, you know, their medical uses, you know, their their artistic kind of like, you know, all the other stuff that tends to be cut away from serious writing about the natural world. And I just think, I just, I guess it's kind of a plea for more of that, that the more various that we can we can bring to bear our emotional as well as our intellectual powers upon problems around us the better basically mm -hmm. uh, we need that we need that stake we need that emotional stake or are we going to let it all fall around you know i know that you could say that you know it's what we're doing is taking out the um the rivets from an airliner as it flies that's what we're doing with the environment but that that kind of you know mm -hmm. being stops you from doing anything you know losing things you love that's a different thing to talk about so that's and i think that that is a um love and concern is always going to be despair and paralysis as a way through this so that's what i try and do gosh i went right off there and no, i really did i'm sorry <laughs> that was great <laughs> so i have to say um uh, this is my this is my last little bit i want you to read a little bit more but um i have to say that i, I wept a few times uh reading this collection i mean very moving the your eulogy to your friend Stu, who you describe as, who was so ready to see magic in the world. I just, yeah. I just love that line. Um, and then the, the, this, the little scratch on the meat of your thumb when the baby Swift gripped your hand before it set sail into the world, the last solid thing the bird would touch for years and just sort of the, just took my breath away. So, but I want to end by laughing because clearly I enjoy laughing. No. So 
I know what you're gonna. Yeah, I know what you're gonna. <laughs> you have to read us goats. Oh man, I love this. I, I, you know, it's the essay. I thought when I, when I, when I gave this manuscript, and I was just like, is this, is this gonna fly? This one, you know, it's like a tiny thing. Anyway, and it's true. It's true. It's all true. Um, <laughs> I sound like a magician, don't I? It's all true. You just have to trust me. Okay. <laughs> thing called goats. As a child, I discovered a simple game that's good to play with goats. You lay your hand flat on a billy goat's forehead and you push just a little and you push and it pushes back and then you push harder and it does too and it's a little like arm wrestling but it's much more fun and the goat always wins. <laughs> I told dad about my love of pushing goats once. Just as an aside, we're talking about something else. And he must have filed this information away because about a year later, he came home very crossly. And he was cross with me, which was a very rare thing. In his capacity as a press photographer, he spent the day at London Zoo taking photographs for their annual animal census. And at one point, he happened to be standing with the rest of the press pack in the petting zoo. And there he sees a goat. And he says to everyone, watch this. I hadn't explained activity very well because he puts his hand against the goat's forehead with everyone watching, then he pushes. He pushes really hard and the goat falls over. <laughs> There's a long silence broken only by the sound of photographers and journalists saying, Jesus, Mac, what the fuck? The goat gets up, stares at him and goes away. And the press pack never let him forget the time he pushed a goat in front of all of them, and it was all my fault. Yeah, I, I just um, he was so cross with me. He um, I was like I was saying, I I don't know whether he'd appreciate that being in there because it does make him look a fool. But he did tell me the story, and, and I <laughs> hey, <laughs> and, and he knew you were a writer, so the goat was fine. Yeah, the goat was fine. The goat was mine. <laughs> so for people in the audience, if you have questions, there's a little box yeah. down here that says mm -hmm. ask a question. And um, uh, we have, we come have on. Questions. This, this, is, this, <laughs> this is your moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now I can't close the questions again. There we are. I can see you again. Um, have I, I, the favorite question I ever was asked she said, yeah. uh, was I was in a talk in, uh, this is way back at the beginning of HS for Hawk. And um, I, you know, I'd done this long answer about, you know, the ethics and morality, the moral injury of, of hunting with a wild creature and watching it do its natural stuff. And I was like, you know, being very delicate and careful about the kind of, you know, the emotional impact of that, particularly for a grieving person. And this little kid stuck his hand up. I'm like, what are you doing here? You know, he was like tiny. And he stood on a chair and said, I have a question. And I said, what is it? He went, what's the biggest thing your hawk ever murdered? <laughs> and, um, I said, oh, I, I think it was a rabbit. And he was like, oh. <laughs> it was really and I, I had to ask him, what, what did you think? What did you think it, you know, the, the biggest thing? He went, a horse. So he went home very disappointed that my hawk hadn't killed Oh my him. gosh. I know. I know. That would be a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, let's get this question. Sorry. Here we go. Mm -hmm. um, will you ever hunt with a hawk again? That's a really good question. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know actually. Um, I think it's quite a common thing as I get older. I feel I don't really want to, to, to hunt, and that's not like a decision about hunting as a as an activity generally. I think there are forms of hunting that are appalling, and I think there are forms of hunting that are very, very sound. It's you know, one of the ways to enlightenment, right? But I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to be part of that. I kill enough things by just being alive. You know, I don't want to go out there and do that. However, I would like to have another hawk one day. Um, um, but there are many, many kinds of hawks that will happily fly around and haven't got a very predatory instinct and might catch stuff that might not. But you know, so I think, you know, living with a hawk and letting it be free as much as possible and then snoozing in the house kind of replicates the natural behavior. So I think I'll do that. But I'm traveling so much, you know, it's an enormous responsibility. Say, it's a lot of time. Yeah. It's going to be much, much later, I think. You know, I, I you know, you the responsibility is to have, if you have a hawk is to fly it, you know, pretty much every day for as long as you can. 
I can't do that. So um, I'll just mournfully look at kites and kestrels as I drive past them on my way to some. <laughs> that's a good question. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the irony of writing a great book about flying yeah. hawks. Is then you can't, you don't have time to fly hawks. <laughs> So from um, Renata Golden, who's actually a friend of mine and a beautiful writer herself, um, really Helen know. spoke of having to learn about mushrooms in order to write about them. Mm. That doing so isn't quite honest. Can you say more about writing honestly in a personal essay? Yeah, uh, I discovered this um, when I was writing Ace of Hawk. Uh, I'd been an academic writer before then. I'd written poetry, both very, very different, you know, forms. And um, I started writing Ages for Hawk, and I, I naively thought that everyone would be interested in the in the hawk. Uh, you know, I wasn't that interesting. You know, my dad died, and I was sad, and I got this hawk, and the hawk is amazing. And I started writing it, and it just didn't work. It was, you know, I kept running up at it, and it was like running into a brick wall. And then I remember having this revelation one day that I was dissembling. I was not being honest with the reader about what was happening. Mm. And I've got to go full you know, full California here. I've got to put it all on the page. That that was not uh, <laughs> dismissive. I just meant that as a kind of, it's not a very British thing to be open about one's emotions. So I um I did that. And as soon as I did, as soon as I was truthful and honest to the character I was then and the person I was as a writer, it began to flow. And you know that feeling when you write. I mean, anyone who writes knows that feeling. You know when the words are cut from rock, you know when they're honest and you know when the, the truth that they are delivering onto the page you know of course it's partial but it feels true and um, i think that is what i mean by the essay writing you know there is a they are essays to me are there's a, a way in which they can feel performative they can feel like little masterworks they can mm. feel like you're showing off if you're not careful just because they're small mm. and they're meant to be jeweled and intricate but actually i realized that you know i don't know very much about the natural world and the fact that i don't know much about the natural world is important you know i try and there are things i don't know so the mushrooms are very hard they're not my area of expertise they're not as bad as dandelions apparently they're the worst thing i was told by a mushroom person that you know if you want to meet you know people who are really gone unhinged from their life of taxonomy you go and find someone who's into dandelions because they're impossible really yeah. <laughs> um so and also just like i know that sounds like i hope it doesn't sound too kind of up myself but it's an act of generosity like you know not i just think confessing when you don't know things you know it, it just kind of it's not just feel true it's also like you know i don't want an essay to be this kind of perfectly annealed enameled thing you know i want it to have holes and bits that are broken i mean we're all broken it's like the difference between a a perfect white diamond and then you know one of those really pretty salt and pepper ones with all the inclusions and sort of bits inside you know i prefer the second you know it's it's yeah. it's more true to how life is so that's that's a very impressionistic answer but basically yeah that's just how i am and that's how i i just feel that's i've got to be honest to my own ignorances and my own mistakes as mm -hmm. like yeah and you, and you do have one essay in the collection that uh, addresses this directly when you're writing about deer that you yeah. don't know much about them and you didn't have any desire and I didn't have any desire to know anything about them and and I feel that there are some animals out there that I feel very much that way that it's sort of like I don't know anything about this but that's I'm fine with it right and then yeah. but of course by the end of the essay that that changes but uh yeah um, deer boring for me and then I realized that they were boring for a reason that's because I wanted them to be kind of magical uh appearances rather than real creatures and then there are other animals that i just don't want to know about i mean ticks and leeches no thank you i don't want to know about that <laughs> <laughs> i did an event a while ago when i was sitting here talking to, talking to an audience and a clothes moth came past and i got up and i was trying to kill it you know and i'm like you know it's one of those things you know I, i'm 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 a i love nature but clothes moths can die they can go <laughs> Okay, we have a question here. You've also written poetry, and are you still writing poetry? Any plans for another collection? From from Jane. Oh, it's been decades, really, since I've written poetry seriously. Um, mm. This is going to sound like it's a dismissal of poetry. It really isn't. Um, I I want to say things clearly at the moment, um, and I'm pretty contented. Poetry always felt to me that it was a kind of fracturing, mm. uh, there's like suturing the world. I, I was very broken when I wrote those poems and um, they were formal exercises in, in putting, oh. um, 
in some ways in, in putting, I quite like to put a lot of uh, the lexicon and the language of, of, of science and, you know, into kind of cramming it into the sort of cadences of lyric poetry. I thought that was really interesting. And they were a little bit like impressionist paintings, really. But I, I just think things are really urgent for me now and I want to just talk to people. So maybe I'll have a devastating love affair and start writing poetry again. Watch the space, you know, it could happen. <laughs> I'm belittling poetry, but they really are. I mean, they, I write poetry when I'm kind of an extremist, so that's, mm -hmm. that's where I came from. And from Jenny Coates, what were the challenges you faced in evolving from an academic writer to a nonfiction essayist? <laughs> this is a, these are the best questions. I wrote a book called Falcon. Uh, it's a, a, a book on the cultural history of falcons, and it's like a kind of, you know, it's like a halfway house. Um, I read it now and I cringe because it's basically a, a person trying very hard to escape the gravitational field of jargon and failing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the challenges are really um, to, I think it's going to sound extraordinary, There's a, I think just to trust oneself and to trust the reader to not care if you're being dumb, right? Because the great terror is, you know, of academia is that sense that you're constantly being judged. And one of the reasons I left academia was because I, I kept finding all this amazing analytical and, you know, theoretical and, you know, mm. stuff that no one was reading outside the academy. And I'm like, everyone should know this is amazing. But another reason was that I think in, it's common to many academic environments, it's a very insecure environment and people quite often bond and make with each other by basically slagging off other people and putting people down. Mm. And I hate that. I hate that. And um, so the insecurity and the terror and the the worry hmm. fully disappeared, which is weird. You'd have thought that actually becoming a writer would be more frightening than being an academic, but no. <laughs> it's you just, just you know, the, the, the freedom of being able to write mm. what you feel and think while still being able to think, in, you know, analytically about stuff it was it was mind blowing. I didn't feel in trouble anymore. Yeah. So I'm sorry, Demi. <laughs> so we have from Rob K. Do you have guide guiding principle that you keep in mind as you navigate and navigate so beautifully the tension between describing the natural world, the external, and your personal world, the internal? Mm, great question. Oh, that's a good question. Damn it. Um we have another two hours here, don't worry. <laughs> At three in the morning for you. You have to go. And, uh, the tension. I think I'm interested in those moments where there feels to be no tension. Um, they are odd, and quite often they'll be like the upholstery buttons that pleat those two states together. Those moments, like, I, like initially we we're talking about figure ground, the moment where it switches, the moment where um, things are and are not at the same time. That's the kind of pinch point between the inside and outside. And so those things kind of anchor it, I think. Um, but a guiding principle, no. I mean, I've always been very, very bad, again, at, you know, talking about essay writing. You know, I would, I, one of the reasons I could never do them was I was told to write a plan. I always write a plan. Always write a plan for an essay. You need to know what you're going to say in the introduction and in the conclusion, and then you just fill in the paragraphs to get there. That was the most annihilatingly it just stopped me writing completely. And the only way I can write, and the only way I can still write, is to just follow a sentence down the page, listen to it really carefully, and see where it end, takes me. Um, and uh, so the only guiding principle is to listen. I know that sounds really unhelpful as a principle, but it's mm. so much like wrangling a horse sometimes. Like you know, sometimes you want it to go somewhere, and it's like, nah, sorry, mate. <laughs> That's <laughs> how it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we have one last one last comment, um, uh, which is not a question, but from a poet essayist, Donna Steiner, one of my favorite poet essayists, um, saying essays can be poetry. And um, mm. I think I I think I remember reading H's for Hawk and then knowing that you had that you were a poet as well, and um, thinking, of course, you know that the. The descriptions of your hawk every time every time you uh would fly your bird there was these exquisite descriptions short or long and i and, and every time i would think how does she do that because each one felt different right there was a different texture there and i thought only a poet pays that close attention um and so i i feel like that attention that to me that that's the poet's gift is the 
the the, the minutia and uh, the essayist is sort of the larger stuff. And I think I think I think you're still writing poems, is what I'm trying to okay. say. I think that's what Donna's saying too here. So no, 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 that's a lovely thing to hear. Um, and thank you, Donna, and thank you. So this has been really. It's been my, one of my favorite events. I've had such a lovely time. Thank you. I wish I, I wish I could hang out with the audience, but you know, obviously we can't do that. <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you both. That was such a wonderful discussion. We did have one last question that popped up oh. just at the last minute from Christy. Who says, do what, are you, what are you working on now? And well, I yeah, um, uh, I am working on um, still trying to get to Midway Atoll, which I meant to be of this summer, but the pandemic held on again. I'm writing a big book about albatrosses, the end of the world, the US military, you know, the, the usual Helen things. And I might be quietly working on a novel with a friend, but we won't talk about that because it's <laughs> um, so that that you know that's kind of like a surprise. Sort of uh, but the big the big new uh, the big new book is um, yeah that I was delayed unfortunately because of the pandemic. But um, you know that's the least of the pandemic's horrors. So yeah, Midway, albatrosses and the end of the world. Another cheerful book for me there. Wow. About wonderful birds, though. Well, thank you both. This was a wonderful discussion. Susan, great questions. Helen, could listen to you for hours. Um, a reminder that signed copies of Vespa flights and also when birds are near are available through the button on your screen. Uh, before we close, I would like to express our thanks to John Mark Bowling of Grove Atlantic Publishing, um, who helped make this event happen for us and thank all of you who took time out of your evening to join us on Crowdcast. We wish you well. Helen, we wish you well. Susan, have a wonderful yeah. time in France. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.